thanks for coming. I know it's the last day of term and you're probably all eager to go start enjoying Christmas, but thanks for hanging around for what should be a very nice talk. We've got um, Ian Phillips here today who, until very, very recently, you can see here, was the principal staff engineer at ARM. And I asked Ian earlier what a principal staff engineer was and I'm still completely sure, but I'm not sure. Good. Either, so. yeah, 52 <laughs> years later, I'm not sure what yeah. one is either. <clears throat> Fortunately, I don't do it anymore. 52 years ago, I got up and started going to work. And 52 years since, I've always got up and every morning have done essentially what somebody wants me to do. And so one of the things that, that I found myself doing was, was looking back in a constructive way, what has changed during the time that I was a design engineer? Because I, I literally moved from school into being a design engineer, which not many people do these days. And uh, it was back in 1964 that I left school without any formal qualifications at 15 and I, I took an apprenticeship with the um, MOD at a weapons testing establishment and they had a department called the instrumentation department and this, this group of people were kind of playing with electronics they didn't know a hell of a lot about it we were using some electrical equipment, electronic equipment but essentially we, our task was to try and measure the things that they wanted measured now this was stuff that went, basically went bang. So you had small bombs and guns and projectiles and we had to measure things like how fast does a bullet go, how fast does it spin, um, you know, if, if something is going to explode, what's the pressure at certain distances from it. It was all great fun because you, hadn't got any, you really hadn't got much equipment to try and do it with so you had to sort of put things together. And uh, so although I was an apprentice and I had a supervisor I was working with, he was a good guy. And so I, we got some really exciting stuff, you know, speed, acceleration, pressure, etc. I also ended up commissioning a radar system on top of a 100-foot tower. You know, this is, this is real hands-on engineering and, and making it work. Um, the thing about it was that although this was 1964, there was an interesting thing that I, that I learned at that point. This receiver, which is a HRO triple conversion uh, heterodyne uh, receiver, uh, is still available today. You can go and buy it on, uh, on the equivalent of eBay. It's got 15 valves in it, and it's still a superb performance for a radio. So it, it, it can do all kinds of things, all kinds of decoding over a... Uh, it's a um, an all-band receiver in the sense that it covers anything anything basically which radiates from 200 kilohertz up to probably 20 30 megs and and it's still a viable piece of kit today it's got 15 valves in it or tubes as the americans call it um i think about that 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 really struck me at that point this had been designed before i moved into this industry so it wasn't designed by me but it was one of the pieces of kit that we had commercial piece of kit it delivered technical excellence despite the fact that it didn't have a transistor or an integrated circuit in there and it did it based on on valves so what's going on you know, here we're talking about signal processing it is an analog signal processor but it's doing what was required to a degree of excellence which is which is good these things were made to to be serviced the, the, on the top of there is a lid that you lift up you expect to have to service these things. The valves don't last forever. When the valves go wrong, you have to replace them. And they're fairly easy, they plug in and out. But to find out if they're going wrong, you have a piece of kit like this, which is a valve tester. And so you plug you, so to service a piece of kit like this, and they used to come into the lab probably every six months, you'd, you'd check to see if they worked against, sig uh, against um, signal generators and so on. But you'd also go through all the valves and test them to find out if the valves were basically good or starting to die. And you went into there, and if, it, if the performance wasn't right, you changed resistors on tag strips underneath, you know, or capacitors or whatever it is that was going. Electrolytic capacitors associated with the power supplies used to be great because they'd go off with a great big bang every now and again. 300 volts, you know. <coughs> So anyway, about this time, so we're still in the 64-65 era, we were very much on the cusp of change. Uh, this was a, a thing called a, a, a counter-timer. It was made by a company called Sintel. And when I first arrived in the lab, we had these things. They, they would allow you to time intervals 
uh, down to around a microsecond um, and or, or count things up to around a million. And the, uh, these counters were sort of stock in trade when you're trying to measure things, you just use them in different ways. And this, this originally was a, valve, a piece of valve kit. That was the, uh, the basis of it, dual triodes, and there were four dual triodes on a board, and the, and the board essentially was a divide by 10. The output was on center zero meters, and so it was an R2R network which was built into the, uh, into the four bits of counter, and that actually did a D2A, D2A conversion, although we didn't really think about it in that way, it just drove the meter. And um, at that time, we were actually seeing new pieces of kit come in. And these had got transistors in instead of the valves. And they'd taken, literally, taken the valve circuit and replaced the valves with transistors. They'd lowered the voltage from 150 volts down to 24. But pretty well, they made a transistor level equivalent to the, to the valve-based implementation board. Now, they didn't really know much about how to connect transistors, and so if you look at this, you see they're just connected, they're soldered, stuck on the back of the printed circuit board. They didn't know how, they hadn't even solved the issue of how you mount something like that. They'd not addressed the issues of reliability, these are still expected to fail on a regular basis, and so you were expected to be able to service them in the same way as you would with, with Valve. Uh, the first counter timers based on integrated circuits, actually appeared just about two years later. And we got a, um, a Rakel counter timer. It was about a fraction of the size, because these ones, of course, had been built big enough to take valve cards. And the, uh, the integrated circuit version, essentially, we opened the box and there was one printed circuit board on it. It had, I don't know, 10 ICs on it. It weren't wildly complicated in today's standards. But we looked at that and the first thing that struck us was, how are we going to service it? Now, it's such a perverse thing to say because today you wouldn't think about servicing the board, you'd just replace it. But in those days, we had moved from a service environment to a, a replacement environment. And we were just taking that first step along the road. And of course, the reliability was so much higher that servicing it was, in, rea in reality, never a problem. Now, I want to, it's important to get this into context because it was only in 1965 when Gordon Moore made his firm, famous prediction. I guess that most people have heard of Gordon Moore. I don't know all your backgrounds, but this is the guy who essentially said that uh, the number of devices on an integrated circuit was going to double every 18 to 24 months. Um, but to put it in, into context, when he made that observation, he was basing his experiences on designing an integrated circuit with 30 to 40 transistors on it, and he was currently working on an integrated circuit with 80 transistors on it. Now that's pathetic by everything that we measure today. He predicted that by 1975, and that's another date which is an interesting one, we'll come back to that, there will be as many as 65,000 transistors on an integrated circuit. Um, well, let's see how it panned out. Well, firstly, of course, what does a 30 to 40 uh, component integrated circuit look like? Well, it's something like that. It's a quad to input NAND gate. Um, and that's the circuit diagram. And, oh, incidentally, that's pretty well the EDA tools as well. So people used paper and pens and slide rules if things got really tricky. And you were going to make something which was going into a 14-pin or an 18-pin um, dual in line pack. You can still get them today. You can still get the devices today. Still not um, uh, irrelevant, but TTL was the, it was the logic of the day. Of course, 1974, that's why the, uh, uh, the date comes back up, because in the meantime I finished my apprenticeship and I went off to university and came back, this time with a first, which is quite credible, but I was 25 by the time I got it. And I'd acquired the beard. The beard is still here. Um, the rumour was that this was to attract the girls, but I think it was entirely rumour. Because I think it was just a ploy to keep me away from the best looking girls. By hiding my beauty under the bushes, you see. <clears throat> and the thing about it was, I'd just done a, uh, a, a degree, an electrical electronic degree. And if you look at the topics that are in it, they're very familiar to what you'd find in the degree today. Um, but this is 1974. This is what, I can't do the maths anymore, my brain's gone. But it's a long time ago, 40 years ago. 
Um, electronics at the time, in the outside world, uh, TV was still valve. Um, you could get five or seven transistor radios, um, but that was pretty well the only electronics that most people had. If you were really sophisticated, the first four function calculators were available. Generally cost about a week's wages, so that's a, it's not, not a trivial thing. All real-time signals and their processing was analog. We didn't actually think about it as being analog. There wasn't any other way. That's just the way you handled signals. Um, in the commercial sphere, single design uh, computers shared by batch use. So we'd have a computer. There wasn't, there wasn't very many MIPS in this average computer. And the way you accessed it was through things like this, a, um, uh, a teletype. teletype produces paper tape with holes in, and it reads paper tape with holes in. So when you type your circuit in, you type in as a series of um, uh, holes in a paper tape, you send the paper tape over to the computer room where they ran a batch process on it, the output was another paper tape, and you ran the paper tape through here and it printed out on paper. And some clever folk worked out a way of using alpha characters to produce waveforms that ran down the length of the paper. That was the state of the art. To, to observe the way things were working. Yet, we were using SPICE. Anybody remember SPICE or know of SPICE? SPICE is the analog simulation tool still in use today. It's the one where you, uh, where you want to de uh, model devices. You model them by their phys physical characteristics. And SPICE, I can't remember exactly what the um, SPICE means, but the IC part of it is for an integrated circuit. So it was anticipating uh, people designing transistors and adjusting the dimensions rather than using physical components, already predetermined physical components. Uh, so TTL was what mainframes were made of. Fortran, language of choice, still is a language of scientific choice. Networking was primitive and local. We're just moving out from networking inside the university when I was there to networking universities. Certainly there was no internet for Joe Public. The car and telephone were very much electromechanical. Cameras were mechanical and chemical. Diaries, organizers, magazines, paper. Anybody remember paper? It's still there. It still has its place. You notice that. Paper hasn't gone away. People talked about the paperless office somewhere in my history of life. Um, it never happened. Well, at least large parts of it didn't happen. Lights were incandescent. Displays were CRT. No LCDs or LEDs. They had, just hadn't been invented then. The question was, had I learned enough when I came out of universities back there to exploit it for the, for the rest of my working life, for the next 42 years? Of course I hadn't. But somehow... There's something about that. We, we assume that we, when we come out of university armed with our quite credible degrees, we're going to know all the answers. We're smart asses, aren't we? We're going to go out there and the world is going to be really pleased to have us. Now, that may be the case. The world may very well be really pleased to have us. But the fact is, I don't know everything when I come out of university. I don't know everything now, but all, I, all I've learned in the meantime is how little I know. And that's the thing which has really changed. Of course not. The process of living as a design engineer has got to have been a dynamic process. So for 52 years I've been changing what I do because I've still had to do design work. That's what I was employed to do. Different design work at different times. But I've had to do that. I've had to adapt what I do as I've progressed through my working life. So a few details. That's what the inside of a, a seven transistor radio looked like really sophisticated manufacturing there. The plastic's pretty crap. It wasn't exactly looking like a, a sophisticated piece of equipment. But in those days, actually, you were so pleased to have it that, uh, you know, in many respects, what it looked like wasn't the major consideration. That was my car. Uh, not literally my car. I don't have a photograph of it, strangely. Didn't take as many photos back then, mainly because, you know, photochemical process, fairly expensive. That's the circuit diagram, the entire circuit diagram, not the first page, it's the entire circuit diagram. There is nothing electronic in there at all, it's electromechanical from beginning to end. Um, and that's the phone. 
1974. This phone, interesting, it's very interesting. It's a rat's nest, isn't it? It's awful. Yet this, this little piece here is a, is a piece of clockwork miracle. This is the dial. This is a centrifugal governor. This, these ten notches around here are the notches that, that when you dial on the dial one to, one to zero, these notches go past the switch and go click, 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 click. One click for, for one, ten clicks for zero. And it's a, a really nice piece of kit. We'll come back to that in a moment. Look at the dates associated with this. This was actually designed in around 1960. It was in production from 1964 to 1984. 20 years this thing was in production. And it was designed for a 20 year lifetime. So it was expected to last till 2004. It was designed in 1960. You can still get them. They still work on, the, uh, on BT wire if you connect them up. It's an amazing piece of kit. Nothing we design today has got anything like that lifetime. This turned out to be quite reliable as well. It's a rat's nest, but it's very functional. It does what it's supposed to do. You can take these things, and there are examples of them being out in mud huts in strange places in very high uh, temperatures and high humidities, and they still work, which most modern kit won't do. So we mustn't dismiss these. They're, they're an achievement. But the, again, 1974. The thing to observe about this is that as time has progressed, the implementations are limited by the technology which is available to the designer. So this is where the designer has an important role to play because the designer is using appropriate technologies to give a solution. The solution is the thing that matters. The technology is the way of getting there. <clears throat> now, 1976, one year later, I was doing my first integrated circuit design. This one uh, was using a technique called four-phase dynamic logic, which has now ceased to exist pretty well. It was using 12 mil, which is 300 micron, PMOS metal gate. This is huge. Uh, one level of metal and one active layer, that's all it was. Three masks in the entire integrated circuit produ uh, production. Uh, the attraction of this was there was no supplies, it was all powered by four phases uh, of, of voltage which were easily generated by a simple inductive uh, circuit with a transistor. So you could, these were compatible with, uh, with that design method. And the thing I was doing was replacing that dial. That was my project. Take out the dial, something which plugs in the hole, which does the same, 10 interrupts, 1 to 10 interrupts, except it does it electronically because people are going to be prepared to pay for something like that because it looks good. Uh, that, that was my project, not the integrated circuit, the whole thing. I had the, the task of doing this and the difficult part of it I had assistance with and the difficult part of it was plastics because I didn't know anything about plastics. So I got a mechanical engineer to help me with that and he did the collapse mechanism on the buttons and he chose a keypad. Um, a, a rubber mat keypad and he made the plastics here and he made and worked with the, the guys who were doing the molding. It was a system product. It was, it was required to do a thing in the box. It was 150 gates, 300 mil on a side and each gate included a register for detail. Now Moore's Law you're familiar with this is, I, I've chosen to use a, uh, a, a graph which was used in the ITRS, which is the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon 1999. So it's a bit, a bit dated, 17 years ago. Uh, but it still has relevance today, and it has relevance today because it has the red line, but we're not going to talk about that just for the moment. Nevertheless, you can see this curve from any number of people. Now, the point about it is 1974 is just about back here, and today is just about over here. So it's not, it's not something which is um, irrelevant because it kind of spreads or spans the gap between uh, when I started in this business and today. Now, extending it to today is just putting that extra line on it and for, for, the, for simplicity it's a good enough extrapolation and it more or less aligns with reality. But if I put the start of ARM, does everybody know who ARM is? Okay, if you've got a smartphone or anything which is semi-intelligent today and it's embedded, then it's got an ARM-based computer in it. So I used to work for ARM and uh, I was there in the beginning. And when ARM first kicked off, 
then we were talking about putting a million transistors on an integrated circuit. Seemed like a big number, actually. Uh, and today, of course, we're talking about maybe 20 billion transistors on an integrated circuit. Now, the integrated circuits cost less. You know, the, in those days, you were, you were paying quite a bit for a million transistors. It was a big one. It was a difficult one to do. Now you pay a few dollars for it. It's really quite, uh, quite small. The, to highlight on that one, was that there is actually a 20,000 times more transistors on an integrated circuit in the lifespan of ARM, which is only 25 years, and the integrated circuit is going 10 times faster, which broadly speaking equates to 200,000 times more raw capacity in that integrated circuit. You don't design an integrated circuit the same here as you do here. You don't design a with the same tools, with the same methods, when it's something which is 200,000 times bigger. It's just fundamentally, it's a, it's a change, and that change has to be encountered somewhere. What I wanted to show, show on this one was, I mean, this is what around a billion transistor integrated cir circuit looks like. This is just a, a photo of NVIDIA's Tegra 3 2012. It's just one that they actually had a die shot of, because most people are fairly protective. Uh, these days. And the fact is, as you zoom in, of course, you're used to seeing things like this. Uh, what you're not used to seeing is that those are three transistors. So there's three transistors there. We're talking about a billion on the circuit. And well, the thing that strikes you immediately is there's a lot of complexity above the transistors. Now, if you move to my earlier model where I said there were just three mask layers and there were 80-ish components on an, on an integrated circuit, you can see that actually complexity has gone up quite a large amount as well. It's difficult to quantify complexity in terms of uh, uh, something which is, um, let's say, a design challenge. But let's say it's not unreasonable to think that during that same period of time, 25 years, that the connectivity, uh, connectivity based complexity has also increased by, let's say, something more than 10, something less than 1,000. Whether it's 100, I don't know. But it's 100 times on top of the, two, the 200,000 that I previously talked about. You're talking about the order of 2 to 20 million times more complexity between when ARM started and today. So, is it that? Not players are required to, to get all the wires through? Yes. But theoretically, do you only need three? Uh, no, well, currently we're using about seven. I know, but three you right. can You can, but the problem is you want to have things rather, cl rather closer together. You want to make more effective use of the transistors. You don't want to have too many dead gaps in between the transistors. So you want to get up and get away as quickly as possible. Uh, you also have an awful lot of rules associated with uh, geometry. You're, what you're allowed to do on, the, on certain layers, like all metals are only allowed to go in one direction on certain layers. They, they can go in another direction on the other layers, but you can't have some going that way and then joggling. You can't do that anymore. So as, as density goes up, a lot of the physical process rules change. Um, let's say the, the complexity, though, you can connect three transistors up the limited number of ways that you can connect up three transistors, there's an awful lot of ways that you can connect up uh, two billion transistors. And so that, that connectivity gives you functionality, but at the same time that functionality costs you in your design methods. So that 20 million times more complexity in the last 25 years has required us to do things that we didn't do. So high-level description languages were never part of the process of design uh, integrated circuits. Back in our, when ARM started, ARM was actually revolutionary in that, that they used a high-level description language to effectively a model-based, uh, model-driven design. So they created a model of what they were going to do and then implemented components of it. Now, there wasn't a language that they could use, so they wrote their own. Uh, so VHDL and uh, Verilog came out subsequent to, to ARM doing that work. Synthesis was, new, was a new kid on the block. It's come in. Verification languages and methods. Verification was never a problem when it was simple. Model-based design, reuse and IP models. This is a fundamental, of course, to ARM's existence. Um, you don't want people to start with a clean sheet of paper. They haven't got enough time to get their products out. If they do, they haven't got a big enough resource to do it. So they have to use what's gone before. 
we weren't using what's gone before, we used to start with a clean sheet of paper. You immediately encounter data management problems. You're creating such a lot of data and you've got large teams of people working on them, trying to make any kind of consistency about your design as it's progressing was something we didn't have as a problem. Self-test methods, embedded real-time software, um, real-time computer architectures, so CPU, GPU, MPU, this whole domain was never in an integrated circuit. We're now talking about having to architect these things to include them in products. Domain-specific knowledge becomes valuable. If I know how to do something, I'm equipped because I'm connected to the internet to help you, somebody remote on the other side of the world, to deliver that thing. So you know, face, facial recognition or uh, uh, detection of uh, foreign objects or behavioral issues. Um, embedded operating systems. There was a lot of discussion in the early days of ARM about whether we would ever need an operating system inside a phone. Yeah, now it's not even a question about whether you need it. It's always there. So these were mostly, the thing to bear in mind, most of these were all sciences when we first encountered them. Uh, they were introduced a year or two earlier than this. And so we didn't get these things complete with a manual to, to say how to use them. We, had, we said it was more a case of, hey, this synthesis stuff, that could be handy. Let's start to use it. Oh, before we do synthesis, we're going to have to have some sort of high-level description language, aren't we, which the, which the synthesis tool can compile. And if we do that, we're going to need to have verification suites to go around this thing to confirm that what we've created is what we expected. And we hope the whole levels of how are we going to use these things were never part of the tools when they first appeared. So we ended up having to do an awful lot of that ourselves. Now we're moved into the system era. The products today are complete. Your smartphone is a phone. It's a phone organizer, a camera, um, email interface. It's anything you want it to be. But the thing about it is it's got to work. That's the first criteria that you use is its functionality. The second criteria is its aesthetic beauty. You know, the technology criteria really doesn't start to make an appearance. But as a design engineer, you're concerned with functionality. You're talking about putting together more than one chip, typically 20 in, an, in a smartphone. Multi-geometry, multi-voltage, multi-family. Some of them are CMOS, some of them are analog, some of them are um, non-volatile memory technologies. You're putting them together as a designer to make an optimal solution. And all the technologies in the box have to work. So the integration to the displays, the mechanics, the audio interfaces, the vibrators, and any other gadgets that they care to have, all have to work. It's part of the design problem to make them work. Because if your design is right, but the product doesn't work, the market doesn't happen. You don't get feedback, there's no money that flows back down the chain, and short, shortly, you're out of a job. It increasingly includes the manufacturing process, and we'll come back to that. Um, it includes the test strategy, because you've got to test this thing, having made it, it's to find out whether it works. It includes the architecture and knowledge-based IP, how to use other people's knowledge when you're designing this solution. And it includes human factors, form and function. The success of a design was never by, measured by the success of a single component. The best that you could ever hope for was to design a component of a system. But it's the way that the system works that is really a measure of the success. So design is about delivering a commercial opportunity. It's about uh, something, it's got to work, it's got to be economical, it's got to be reproducible, it's got to be innovative. And innovation is a, a kind of buzzword that people love. Uh, really all innovation means is that you're going to be cleverer than your competitor. In some way, you've got some commercial advantage. Now it might be that you use a, a more advanced process technology, it may be that you use a clear case, it may be that you put it in a, a different kind of battery technology. These are all ways that you can differentiate your product and it's your product sales that ultimately count. So innovation might be, I know we could use the latest silicon processes, or I know we could use the latest operating systems, but actually we can get a commercial advantage by putting this in a, in a metal box rather than a, a plastic box. And that's a legitimate market. 
So what we have to do as designers is to deliver a promise for the future. So this is, it's kind of easy to sound with, but actually most, most people are not very good at predicting the future, and yet somehow as engineers we're expected to do. We have to say that we can do something, buy somewhere, at a certain cost, and achieve a certain quality. That's a pretty big ask, actually. And yet, somehow, it's kind of expected, because we're dealing with the laws of physics, that we can do that if we claim we're going to do it. But bear in mind that when you undertake a design, that's what you're agreeing to do. Um, the appropriateness of the technology is often down to you, because nobody else knows more about it than you do. You've been brought in, you're doing the role that you're doing because of your specific knowledge in that area, because of the awareness of how it's connected together. And it's important that if it's inappropriate, so we're, we're, we're fighting to use this method and to make it work, but actually if it's not going to work and there's an easier one, then the onus falls on you to tell this is, this is the inappropriate technology. It's not going to deliver what we want in the, in the time it's expected to the quality, to the cost, whatever. That's the thing. Create marketi marketable product differentiation. It's got to be a product and it's got to be differentiated. So enough of the hard stuff. Let's go back a little while, little while because this is Baby, which is University of Manchester's computer, uh, 1947. Um, they weren't using valves just to be awkward. They were using valves because they didn't have transistors, you know. This was a state-of-the-art demonstrator. You, nobody doubts for, that, that it's not a valuable thing to do. It's a computer. It's the basis of our computing today. It's also the basis of our smartphones and all the rest of it. So the, the concept was valid even back in 1947. The implementation technology wasn't up to what we can do today, but it nevertheless was a good demonstrator, a good basis to get to carry on. Now, it was undoubtedly driving the technology at that time. If you wanted to be involved in computing, then you, to drive something like this, you more or less needed a PhD. You couldn't, you couldn't understand the circuit. There was no tools to help you, uh, help you use it. And you were working really from a theoretical maths point of view about that you know, a machine like this could really do all that you wanted it to do. It had to be formally proved, or at least proven, whether it was actually formally proved at that point, I don't know. But the concept, at least, was demonstrated there. It was driving the technology, and the users of this were, pe were people who you would call professionals. Now, is it the same then? So is modern computing technology also driving the, uh, the technology today? Well, the answer is no. Although these are still the highest performance machines you're going to find anywhere in a box. Um, you know, even the workstations are quite credible uh, high performance machines, but they're not driving the technology anymore. That's what's driving the technology today. It's the consumer because the net volume of technology which is shipped is way higher in this area. The net value of the technology we shipped is way higher in this area. Yet those are consumers who are buying this. They don't buy it for its technology, which is clever and sophisticated. They only buy it for its function. And they buy it because they like the look of it. And they buy it because it's, you know, it's got a whole series of second order considerations, which as a technologist you sometimes find rather difficult to, to, to come to terms with. Nevertheless, it's worth looking at. We still have mainframe computers today. And we still have... Um, a, whole se re a whole range, a whole series of intermediate models, mainframe, mini, personal, desktop, uh, internet, mobile internet, and IoT, of course, are just around the corner. The thing about these is, at one stage, they were pretty well the only game in town. Um, and although they depressed a little bit when the excitement went away, they more or less stay there growing quietly over the years. So we still have mainframes today. We still have minis and we still have personals. Although the volume and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the area of silicon and the, uh, and the total value of the market is undoubtedly dominated by this. What it means though is that the technologies are being driven by this. So the smallest geometry processes, the use of embedded operating systems, the, the, um, the software design methods for apps and the, and the equivalent of, are dominated by this area. 
and yet they are influencing the mainframe. So if you want to build a mainframe computer today, then you have to use the technologies which are, which are available to you in this space because it's only this space which can afford the investment. So if you go and you start to look on the web, you'll find that the next K computer from NEC is going to be ARM-based. ARM-based, ARM, the CPU, which is in, you know, in a, a, a low-performance CPU for use in smartphones and so on. It's very small, but you can put an lot, awful lot of them in a box. And whereas the mainframe guys would probably still like to have one humongous computer, they've decided that they can actually get more performance and better power efficiency by using the technologies which have effectively developed out of this space. So the disappointing point about it, though, is this. Whereas professionals were the ones who were determining what the historic technology roadmap was going to be, it's the consumers that are determining it now. So if you ask a professional where the next technology lead should be, they will give you the wrong answer today. Because it's the consumer that you've got to ask. And the consumer is... Sorry. Guido. But to what extent is new stuff fed down the throat of people who don't really need them? I mean, to, to call it a consumer pull, is it not an industry push? Uh, it's probably complicated to say it's not uh, it's one or the other the fact is that the industry is encouraging consumers to want to consume but it's the consumers who ultimately put their hand in their pocket and find the money and put it on the table if you, if you design a smartphone to last 20 years that would be a catastrophe uh, from a business point of view yes Yes, but that's not a product. The product is, exactly. yes, I mean, what you're talking about is demonstrators may still be driven by the professional identified need, but the products are, de are driven but at the motion by... It's been running a long time, and yes. it's a really good example of a design, an mm. engineering example. So, yeah, it's two different uh, developments. No, they're part of the continuum, they're not too different. This. It's the era that's moved on, but actually it's still the same thing. But that is like what they say, like, um, the, some people say, we don't know what we want. Yeah. And yes? say, yes, we have to listen to the market because that's where the money is. So the, but the marketing, marketing people will say, you know, will ask you as a consumer, because don't forget you're also a consumer, you, you go out and buy your electronic gadgets. Uh, they will ask you as a consumer what you want for your next product. And incidentally, that product is going to be three years from now. So the marketing people will come along to you and they'll say, what, what are you going to want to buy next, please? What features will it need to have? Um, and you don't know. Not unreasonable. Most people think only, wow, this is impressive. I got this functionality in front of me. Now, the marketing people will make some sort of call on that and they'll specify a series of products. The companies will go ahead and make those products. Probably nine out of ten of them will fail. They'll have put a lot of money in it and they won't succeed. But one of them will have got it right. And one of them, you buy. You don't buy the nine that didn't, because you buy the one that succeeds. And not surprisingly, because that's what human, human nature does for us. Um, but it means, it means that we don't actually have to specify exactly what those people want, because the, the marketing people are paid to do this. They take a guess. You know, they get as much facts as they can do and then they take a guess because it's going to be two or three years into the future. And they will have to gamble quite a lot of company money and resources to try and make that happen. And they don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be. But it's the commercial imperative which nevertheless specifies those products. So it's only when you're a successful company that you actually have the benefit of looking back and saying, we did the right thing. Everybody else just doesn't get that chance. Now, IoT is interesting because this line here is the population of the world. So IoT is now getting to the point where you're going to be shipping tens of processors to everybody in the world, or hundreds of processors to those people who've got lots. Now the thing about that is, you don't buy processors one at a time when you're buying a hundred of them. You buy them in a can of paint. You buy them in your car, in your toaster, everywhere. They're, these are now actually moving out of the consumer domain. 
So the consumer only buys a toaster or a tin of paint or a, a, a new heating system or whatever. He gets the processes. What do you mean exactly by IoT? Internet of Things. That's what it means. Now, that's the, the glib answer is nobody actually knows what it is. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of speculation about it, because, but it's actually a marketing term as much as anything. It, there is a fair degree of certainty that it will happen. The question is, because uh, it's already happening in many respects, the question is, is it going to be one product which sells at colossal volumes, or is it going to be a million products which individually only sell at very modest volumes? Now, you've got to try and make a business model which fits that. And so a lot of people are trying different business models, different architectures, hardware and software implementations. And at the moment, nobody really knows which one is going to work. But it's like, like I was saying before, they're putting a lot of money into these. They're trying all sorts of different things. And probably, almost certainly, some of them are going to work more successfully than others. In a couple of years' time, we'll look back and we'll say, you know, that Internet of Things happened. Um, and maybe there was a dominant player in it. I mean, in some respects, ARM became the dominant player in the IP-based design space. Um, so maybe there will be something similar. And of course, everybody wants to be that dominant player. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mind. Are, are, you, are any of you in a desperate hurry? Because I'm not. I can, right. Okay, and whichever you like. Because I, I can continue talking as long as you're happy to, to sit here. So. Something that strikes me in this, in this graph. So ARM was born in '91, right? Yes. So it's the exact period of personal computers, desktop internet. Yes. And that's exactly the field where ARM is absent. Yes. But it was, it was the emergence, it was the emergence of the, uh, well, mobile phone, you see, somewhere in, in this space we were getting mobile phone. This is the computing model. Yes. Yes. There was, ARM wasn't the only company that tried to sell IP-based CPUs. There was a, another company that, because I used to work for Plessy Semiconductors here in Plymouth. And I was out looking for a CPU to put into our cell library for our ASIC design tools. And there was a company called Mark Eric Jones, MEJ, who was selling an 8051 CPU, which they had reverse engineered. There was MIPS, strangely. They were there in those days. And literally, we were looking at either of those two. And ARM came along, brand new kid on the block, based in, uh, in Cambridge. They had experience of the Archimedes computer, and we liked what they had to say. Principally, the thing that we liked about them most is that we knew absolutely nothing, because we were a silicon fab, we knew nothing about computers, how to program them, or anything like that. And these guys in Cambridge were prepared to help us, because they, they knew about how to make a system based around a computer, and they knew how to program it. MIPS guys, these were all computer geniuses. They were all, you know, super way up there in the clouds. And one guy told me, I don't know why we're wasting time talking to you, because you don't know the first thing about computers. Which, of course, was a marketing mistake, because the reason we were talking to them is that we didn't know the first thing about computers. Um, Mark Eric Jones, with uh, his, his processor, the problem he had is he couldn't actually verify that it was an 8051. He had a design, which he claimed was an 8051, but we, w we anticipated selling this to people who wanted to produce integrated circuits to replace um, a design that they already had where they used the discrete 8051. So from our point of view, it had to be compatible. So his product didn't fail. Now, at the same time, we were also designing um, our own complex integrated circuits. And I won't say they're you know, complex by today's standards, but they were complex by those standards. We needed to use little processes inside them to control and manage them. And the guys who were designing those says, we don't want to worry about any of these CPUs. They're easy. We'll design our own. And so we had four CPUs in this, in this model, and one of which was, don't worry, we'll design our own. Now, the, the don't worry, we'll design our own totally ignored the issue that reuse was going to become a major problem. It was going to take so much effort to design chips that we couldn't continue to design all of it ourselves. And so that group actually failed. They folded. The group clo closed down. The whole activity that they were working on inside TMC closed down. Um, and at least a significant part of that was because they believed they could do it all themselves for too long, and they couldn't do it. Yeah. To come back to your question. Yeah, um, so the dominant player would be the one that has the use case right and clear. Uh, the technical uh, capability and the experience from all the 
that yes. Failed, yes. But just because you have all of those things doesn't guarantee success. No, you have to be really You have to be lucky as well. Unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Arm was lucky. Arm was there at the time when, when it became apparent that people couldn't afford to keep doing this themselves. The uh, GSM phone was just about to set off on the market, which needed a processor which had more power in it than an 8051 could give you. So it needed a, a 16 slash 32-bit processor. Nobody really wanted to go to 16-bit. They've just done 8-bit. And they, with 32-bit on the horizon, they were saying, well, if we do this one conversion over to 32, at least we won't have to change again for some time. And so ARM was just lucky. It had the right model. It also had the right business model. Because the other thing that ARM did was... It had what we, what we call shared risk business model. So we didn't sell it, hand it over, and say, there you go, good luck. What they actually said was, Here's a, you know, give us a deposit. Here's some of the money. We will give you this. But the thing is that we will uh, share in the success of your product. We want to have a percentage of everything that you ship. So the, the more successful you are, the more we get out of it. And that, that tie-in turned out to be a very important business uh, differentiator, actually. Uh, and so the CPU was, well, it was clever, but it wasn't that clever. It was a risk-based risk CPU. The business model was different. The shared business model turned out to be very important. And that was the thing which made it into a product. It's, it's, so technology is important, but it's not the only part that's important. Can I move on? I can. So I'll come back to this line because I, I did mention the red line and uh, the red line is the productivity line because um, although we were looking at the number of transistors back in 1999 ITRS was saying we're going to have a productivity problem here um, there was some figures that had been coming out for the amount of effort that it was taking to design some chips which are the data points for the number of gates and the gap was getting bigger and it happened that around ARM's foundation time, it was taking around 100 person years of effort to design a chip. But the, the uh, future projections were huge. You know, 100 was kind of manageable. It was a biggish group of people working on it. And we was, you, know, you could look at some things which we'd done before. And also, we were doing reuse rather early. Uh, so those, those numbers were kind of manageable. But you could see it was getting out of hand very quickly. The EDA tools weren't performing adequately. They weren't giving you the, um, enough improvement for every process generation that was going on. And the other thing that, that became apparent too was as we started to move down this ro route, there was a thing coming up which we subsequently called the verification gap. The only thing you could say about verification is it hadn't been a problem when the design wasn't too complicated. You just stick it in a board and you checked if it worked. And you could look at it with a scope and you could more or less work out what the problem was. But the verification became a very much bigger issue, and it was heading that way. Now, although we, uh, we were saying, bearing this in mind, this is 1999. Nine, that's about the time of this graph, incidentally. So it's, you know, it's, it's still a retrospect looking back. The verification gap hadn't really started to open, so it was just becoming apparent at that time. Um, looking back now from here, however, what happened to the productivity gap? It's not there. We don't see it today as a problem particularly. People can produce tablets and smartphones who have never been associated with it. You know, Amazon and Tesco produce their own tablets. Um, how can they do that? And of course the answer is it's all modular and it's all become reuse. There are people who know the methods and there are various people who can help you to build these things together essentially out of blocks. It doesn't require the level of detail that went below. Now, from my point of view, when I started designing chips, I was the only designer. In fact, back here, I was the only designer and I was designing the rest of the system as well. Uh, but it, we moved through the era of single, single designers, small teams, essentially local, local teams, because we didn't really have the internet then, so you had to have your team around you global teams. It's not just a case of the internet. You also have to have methodology which is going to allow you to work as a group in a way that you've never worked as a group before. And that had impact on the nature of design. So we used a clean sheet, some reuse, starting to come in here about the time of ARM, hardware and software reuse. 
you know, software is becoming a major part of the design case. And so it now becomes a case not just of you know, hardware and software, which is what it used to be, but hardware and software, and also system. Because we're starting to move into the area, area where expertise matters rather than the implementation technology. So um, the GPUs inside ARM are a mixture of hardware and software. They deliver at their interface a, um, uh, an API, which is totally invisible to the customer. The customer, the user, doesn't see that, that interface at all. From our point of view, from ARM's point of view, I can't use the R word anymore, um, from ARM's point of view, how they partition the system between hardware and software internally is entirely up to them. Because as long as they maintain the API, then that's all that the user needs to know. So we trade, we have traded, they have traded, past tense all again. Um, we changed the methodologies during that time to handle the reality of, uh, of systems. It also means that this, the verification issue, it's an issue, you still have to do it, you never had to do it before, but it's not become unmanageable. The reuse, the productivity issue, all designs are doing lots of reuse. So we don't have to design everything on a clean sheet of paper anymore. It means that almost everything that is used in tomorrow's product is based on today's product. One way or another, it may be inside the company or it may be that they use the skills of somebody like Arm to do that part of the work which doesn't, need, doesn't give them a commercial differentiator. So it means that we are doing huge amounts of reuse today but we don't even recognize it. We tend to think we're starting with clean designs all over the place, but we're not. Everything is reuse. It's greater, my personal view is it's about 99% reuse today. There is a grounds, even 0.5%, 99.5%, let's say, even 0.5% still represents a very substantial design effort. So you may only be talking about a few million transistors which are going to be flown around your integrated circuit, a, num a number of um, routines or library components which hadn't been necessary before, or connecting together networks in a way that they hadn't needed before. But they amount to a manageable productivity to deliver a functional system. We've got two questions coming. It's all right. No, you haven't had a shot yet. Um, so does, what does that mean in terms of new companies starting? Because if, if you can't produce something from scratch, then how can you kind of start a new, say you want to make a new CPU company? Is it even possible now? Well, yes, it is. Of course it's possible. There are, well, you have to make sure you've got a good business model. Yeah. But if you wanted to make a CPU co company, you have to ask yourself, what need are you trying to, f yeah. to fill? Yeah. Because if you're only trying to be a competitor to ARM, yeah. that's not really a business that's model. No, what, you, what you've got to be doing is delivering something that yeah. people want. There's so now, much involved in these, these yes. circuits nowadays are so complicated and they're based on so much that's been reused from earlier products. If you don't have those earlier products... I haven't got it in this slide set, but one of the things that people tend to make a mistake about with ARM mm. is that ARM is just a CPU, isn't it? Well, in point of fact, yeah. the original ARM was just a CPU. Yeah. You now have this vast infrastructure. There's 24 CPUs in the family. Yeah. You've got all of the um, partnership model of all of these people who are working in compatible ways yeah. with the CPU. And then you've got the software environment and all of the operating systems and all of the libraries and all of the uh, APIs that have to be maintained and established. You know, we have a huge infrastructure yeah. with a little tiny essentially a chip on the, on the top of it. Um, now somebody who undertakes, and uh, so if you look at RISC-V processor, for example, which is the commercial open, open, sorry, the open source uh, CPU, which has been designed out of a uh, consortium of universities in the States, um, they essentially have just got a CPU. Now, one of the big things that, are, that um, impresses ARM's customers is the light is the um, the roadmap where the processor is going to go because they have a huge amount of investment in today's solution they want to use it tomorrow now with arm they have a track record of series of generations, you know, roadmaps saying we were going to do this, and we more or less did, uh, and we have a roadmap that goes out, so they've got a fairly high degree of confidence that they're not going to be let down 
when they do their next generation of product because if they miss their beat on the next generation of product, they're out of business. So they, they can't afford to get the beat wrong. Risk five is just a total unknown to them. You know, yes, okay, you can use it now and it's not going to cost you a license fee to use it, but you know, what's the support for next year? Um, you, know, you can take it yourself, but actually you haven't got a team of CPU experts. You can't advance it to keep the performance that you need to have to meet your next generation of product requirements. You know, it's, the, the whole thing sits in a very complex network. I mean, yes, there is an opportunity. If there is something stupid that ARM is doing or not doing, then there is a commercial opportunity there for somebody to take it. But you have to look at it in its proper context to make that decision. So people can make another smartphone. Let's move up the food chain a little bit. People can make another uh, smartphone. And they can decide that, you know, a brick-sized one actually offers a lot of advantages. Well, robust ones, the ones that, that builders use on top of uh, outside. And, you know, this is a perfectly legitimate business model. It's not where Apple want to be with their iPhone. Uh, but nevertheless, can be a perfectly good business for a lot of people. They don't need to design these chips. They don't even need to design the board. They don't need to touch the software. It's just... You know, put the box, boxes together. Where do you get them from? You go to somebody who knows how to do it. They know where to go to get the things from. You know, it's a hierarchy now of companies working together, a network of companies working together. Um, so it may be somebody like, um, uh, well, Apple is a little bit of a bad one, but let's, let's take um, Samsung. Samsung are much more likely to use IP blocks from all over the place. Uh, Apple do, they're just a lot more secretive about it. Maybe it's a stupid question, but so you said like 90%, 99.5% yeah. of the years. But when ARM introduced ARM64, for instance, I, I would intuitively think that it requires a lot of change in many places when you go from 32 bits to 64 bits the design of your chip, or maybe I'm just completely... Uh, well, actually, it makes very little okay. difference, but it does, it does make differences from the CPU's point of view. But inside the CPU, um, a lot of the differences are not as big as you'd think they would okay. be. Um, the, so you don't have a full 30, uh, full 64-bit address space. Mm -hmm. You actually have, I think it's um, a 48-bit address space. Um, the, some of the um, jumps become indirect jumps rather than direct jumps. But there are some things which are performance related, which you can do directly because of 64 bit, and you can't do in 32. Uh, but the, the other thing, of course, which is, which is a bit bizarre, is in this 64 bit machine you have 32 bit instructions, you also have 8 bit instructions. You have, the, you have the thumb instructions, which are still in there. Well, still in there. So Very you, attractive in, in many ways. What you say is that there is no, neither yesterday, today, or tomorrow, big technological changes that might kind of question those 90%? Well, the CPU, one of the, the biggest changes that's gone on is the difference between CPUs, GPUs, and GPGPUs, um, and MPUs, because historically, you did it all in the CPU. Now, we expanded the CPUs as far as it was reasonably possible to do, and then you start to be able to put them together in clusters, um, uh, up to 64 CPUs in a cluster, which we can, we can handle in the methodology. But then there are some things which it's just inappropriate to use a CPU for. Now, GPU is the first one in this space. But the, um, in terms now of um, the architecture of what are effectively specialist accelerators so they're aimed at specific application spaces these are accelerators which are programmable but they are they're not going to be much use if you want to use them outside that space and so there's a whole new raft of uh, GPU G, GP GPU accelerators processors which are which are supported by in the arm standard family but there is also another set which have only just come out They've been announced, and I can't remember, I'm giving, stalling in time to see if I can remember, but I can't remember. This is the extensions which are aimed at HPC applications. And these effectively do away with um, any fixed length of interpretations, either of data or instructions. So you, everything is flexible. And, uh, and that's... A, Hmm? You don't talk about FPGAs. No, no, no. It's, but it's a, if you like, FPGAs is an extreme of this model. 
uh, but it's not. The, the, there is a, is a term that we've got for it. Um, I think it's an industry standard term ARM has got for it, uh, but I can't remember what it is for the moment. Fortunately, I'm probably not going to have to either. I have maybe another question just, uh, of, uh, you distinguished four, four steps, four distinguishable steps for uh, human resources uh, needed for, for, for the design. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering uh, if there will be a need uh, to get further steps like that. Oh, I'm sure there will. will be the fifth step. Yes. Well, I don't. The global team. These these are not really hard steps. They're they're really a case of saying. If you look back, we used to do it a clean sheet. We did some reuse. We did hardware and software reuse. It's not so much that there was a time when we stopped doing it and switched to another. There was a progression. And I think that we're going to... The expertise reuse is probably a rather ge too general term because there is going to be higher levels of expertise reuse. Yeah, with expertise, yes, but what about global team? I mean, what can, you, can you get more than global team? Well, if you think about the way, way global teams work today, um, individually businesses ultimately tend towards doing the thing that they are specifically good at in the life cycle of whatever it is that they're making. So businesses, teams, ultimately become ultimately specialised and they work in a network to create, which is a dynamic network, to create the ability to deliver a product which is probably very specific. Now, those are still global teams because we're limited by global. But whereas we're talking about here essentially global working, this is not everybody working together, this is groups of people working together. Um, so there is plenty of scope in there for everybody. If you, if you micro-slice the future product in terms of a series of expertise, a large number of series of expertise, not, sequen not just sequential but, but parallel, networked and mesh, then the opportunity for, I'm not sure quite what you'd call it, but it's, it's almost like, um, it's like omnipotence. You know, I, I, am, I am providing this, ex this skill, I'm not even identifying who I'm providing it to. Because everybody who needs it is using it. And I get money back out of the chain of this success. I, I don't know quite what you call it, but that's perhaps the extreme that, you, that, you, that this is capable of going to. But I don't think actually that, the, that we're approaching any kind of boundary on this thing. I think it will continue. We will look back and we will say there were, div there were further divisions actually. And we can look and we will make more sense of these in the past. These weren't as hard as that. They were, they were closer. This is just my ideas put down. It's not something which is definitive. There's a lot of scope left for doing things. I mean, the other thing I talk about is, is cameras. Because this is a lot closer to, you know, most people have a memory, most people in the room have a memory which goes back to 1998. Uh, because this is what cameras looked like in 1998, and this is Canon, Canon is still in the camera business, and this is a pretty good uh, prosumer product. So it's semi-professional consumer product, and it was a good camera then. And it was excellent lenses, fine mechanical mechanisms, electromechanical exposure meter, quite novel, photo cell and a, a meter which as you press the button you pinned the pointer of the meter in one place and that was used to select the shutter speed. You know, it was really sophisticated. Uh, metal and some plastic forming doesn't exactly look wonderfully sophisticated but it was quite clever, quite clever put together, manually assembled and a 2D photochemical memory. You know, we call it film in, in retrospect but that's, there's some interesting things here um, one is 3D to 2D transposition, which we're still doing today using a lens. A lens is a wonderful vehicle for doing that. We somehow don't think of it as signal processing, but it is. It's processing this three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional representation. 
and then we're using a photochemical process to fix the two-dimensional representation in a way that you can then express it. Now, for some reason, your eye is pretty good at interpreting it directly as a representation of a three-dimensional world, even though it's only two-dimensional. So it does fairly good, and it's a, it's a simple model, but it's actually a lot more sophisticated than it looks. <clears throat> Of course, today, still a professional uh, prosumer camera, uh, the Canon EOS 5D, still a, mecha a mechanism for enhancing human memory. Uh, it still uses lenses for the 3D to 2D transposition, probably better, but still using effectively analog technique for this because it's just difficult. The performing, the, the plastics and metal are still in there, though you've got to agree they look a lot better than they looked back then. But then of course there's a lot of other things which have made an appearance in the meantime, not least of which is a computer, because it wouldn't be anything if it didn't have a computer these days to manage the complexity of the system. But it's also got other things, analog electronics, networks, GPS, sensors and transducers, precision mechanics, micro motors, energy and batteries, all LEDs and discharge tubes, all of these things have gone into the camera. They weren't in that original camera. Um, the other thing that's in that camera is the manufacturing process. You don't think of it, but this, this camera cannot be assembled by hand. It actually has to have robotic assembly because in particular things like the uh, micro motors which do the focusing of the lenses these are uh, these are piezoelectric motors which effectively work their way around a, a ring driving the motor uh, driving the lens but there are other things in there as well which are just too small but the mechanical the manufacturing method is a part of the design process today these things cannot be designed in isolation from that and neither can they be designed in isolation from the testing you're going to make this thing, how are you going to test it? There's a lot of knobs, a lot of whistles, they can all be, a lot of bells and whistles, they can all be adjusted to different settings. You've got to be able to test that thing works without having to go through all of the combination of all of the settings. So, this is an electronic system product. It's about the viable, timely, economical integration of multiple technologies. It's already moved on from hardware and software co-design. So many people keep banging on about hardware and software co-design like it's something which is new, like it's something which is a challenge. It's something which is not being solved prettily, but as far as industry is concerned, it's getting by. Industry is about delivering, not about making something perfect. This works quite well, incidentally. There's a lot of cameras which don't. Anybody remember Kodak? <laughs> They thought that film was the most important part. You know, it's easy to focus on the wrong thing. Well, what I heard about Kodak, if I'm correct about the story about them, they were the company who designed actually the digital camera. They yes, they did. To, they didn't believe in They didn't, no. No, the resolution, of course, in the, in the first years of digital cameras, 640 by 480 gave some pretty poor photos. And uh, they, the 640 by 480, they were still putting three colors onto those as well. So the actual um, uh, individual color resolution was probably something like 200 by 400. You know, it was ever so poor. Uh, so not really surprisingly, then they, they went up to their marketing people and said, you know, we've got this wonderful new electronic gizmo. And they said, that's an awful picture. <laughs> no future in that. The other thing that's been happening too is the, this is a thing called bill of materials. Um, it's a list of all of the physical components that go inside a product, whatever the product may be. Classically, uh, for a smartphone, this will have a, you know, a battery, it'll have a list of all of the capacitors, integrated circuits made by somebody or other. Physical components, printed circuit board, LCD, earphone. This list is generally considered to be uh, the phone. If you take all those components, you put it together, you have a phone. It totally ignores all the virtual components which make it into a working product. So all of the um, knowledge associated with analog and digital design, embedded software, signal processing, the display technologies as opposed to a display, um, the, re the research which is necessary to go into the background, the education and training, not only to use it, but also necessary to enable people to, to create these systems, are all virtual components in that smartphone. They're in there, 
but you don't solder them into a printed circuit board. You don't buy them from Radio Spares or one of the other uh, component providers. This is a battle which, is, which I was still fighting, and it's one that now I guess you guys are going to have to continue because I can't fight it myself anymore. Virtual components are the largest component cost in a product like this, and yet they don't appear on the bill of materials. If it doesn't appear on the bill of materials, it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, you can never make any business out of it. If you can't make business out of it, you can't keep providing it. So it becomes actually very, very important to avoid virtual components becoming out of sight and out of mind. Because that's, in many respects, what's funding everything that we do, everything that we are. So the, the thing that we're trying to do, one of the, one of the things that we've, uh, we've been working on, of course, on, on all of this time, is trying to keep up with the opportunity that the silicon has provided. So there's Moore's Law again, it's still in there. Um, and this has kept on doubling the, if you like, the functional opportunity that a, piece, a certain square area of silicon will give us. And it's really finding ways to use that as productively as possible that's, that has um, resulted in the architectural changes, the system architectural changes over the years. So embedded software, for example, is a productivity tool. It's a way of using transistors. It means that the people who are designing the integrated circuits don't have to design individual transistors all the time. They can actually design a CPU or a block of memory, and you can put those things together down on the chip, and you can do the utilization of, the, the, of the, those transistors using a methodology which is conveniently called software. But it's just a, a method of using that opportunity. That's the thing that drives us here. It's the opportunity which goes inside that package. Now, the package was a single chip. It is becoming a system. So it's not just a single chip anymore. It's the functionality that can be put inside an object like a smartphone. It's, it's, uh, it could be an object like a high-performance computer, however. It could be an object like a uh, data center. It's all to do with density, and it's making use, the maximum use of that, as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. And these methods, then, you don't think of them as hardware and software, and never the twain shall meet. You think of them as ways of delivering functionality. So the architecture of the system is an appropriate mix of hardware, software, analog, display technology, manufacturing technology, reuse. All of these things are part of that design decision which has to be made. And the methods, methods for reuse, methods for high productivity, methods for using other people's reuse, system mentality, thinking about it's got to work, the whole thing has got to work together. It's an alloy. It's an optimal alloy. Silicon is not the center of the universe, however. It's probably the third or fourth planet. System is the sun. The other planets are important, but the thing that matters in all of these is the, is the thing which stops you getting your product out. So the thing which is the most important technology is the one you don't have. Because that's the one that stops you producing something which is competitive. And that puts you out of business pretty quick. So Moore's Law is traditionally known as doubling the functional density of silicon. Actually, it's still, the, still viable. You just take away the logic density and replace it with functional density. It's about doubling the functional density in the box. And if you think of it in that sense, then Moore's Law is just as valid today. And it's going to go on forever. How do you measure that? <laughs> well, devices, you may have noticed in the beginning when Gordon Moore was talking, he was talking about devices, not transistors. Yeah. So the, the 30 to 40 com, uh, device chip included resistors. So he was including resistors in his count. Uh, so it became transistors, yeah. became gates, actually. So it's, uh, I mean, today m nobody really knows how many transistors they've got on an integrated circuit. There's no way of finding out. It's all synth synthesized and moved away. You can only make pretty broad estimates, actually. Um, so I think it's, how do, you, how do you calculate it? Don't know. I mean, it's like, like MIP is a unit which, is, which has got some significance, and you can probably find another way of measuring functionality. 
So I am getting to the finishing line. This is my finishing line. 52 years of rapid change of products and their implementation technologies, which I was always expected to comprehend and op optimally deploy. That's interesting because I always felt that I didn't know. I didn't know enough. I always felt a little bit of a cheat. You know, uh, other people seem to know much more about this or that or the other than I do. The fact is that we're all doing this. It's all advancing for all of us all the time. And the stuff that we knew last year is stuff that's known. We don't, that's not exciting anymore. We already know that. The thing which, is, which you're being challenged with all the time because you're being asked to push this thing forward is the stuff that you only have a vaguest inclination about right now. You may not understand. It may be something that somebody else does understand, but you don't understand it. So you can't understand how it mixes with the bit that you do understand and that they don't. But nevertheless, you feel all the time like you're on the, on the wrong foot. A bit of a fraud. But it's a tough but exciting engineer uh, life being a design engineer, I enjoyed it. But it recalibrated for me what formal education was about. I always felt a bit of a fraud because, you see, I still left school without qualifications and I don't have a doctorate. And that's always been a little bit of a bugbear. It sits on my back all the time and, it's, and it became an ir irritation. And yet, it was quite, quite clear that I was able to contribute. People wanted me to be there, to say things, to contribute to things, to help to organise the way, the way that we were going. I was an engineer right through to the day I retired. The thing, the thing that struck me about it was that formal education got me into a room. Think of it as a room, a meeting room, or a group of people, or whatever. It got me there. The thing that kept me there was the fact that I was contributing. Whatever that contribution may have been, I was bringing something into that room which the room needed. Essentially, the room was a team trying to solve a problem. And I had given something to that team. And the measure of success in my giving that something was that he invited me to the next meeting in that room. So I had been a contributor. Therefore, when, we're next, when the next problem arises, I could be a contributor to that. The other thing was... Looking, at, looking back at the rate of change that's gone on in that time, it was necessary for me to learn something in that room as well. It wasn't just a case of deploy the knowledge I had, but I also had to pick up something in that room. Now, these rooms can be formal training. You can go out and do an external course, but at the same time they can be informal. There's a bunch of guys around you and you bring a mathematician in who's who's going to help to solve this problem. You learn a little bit about what a mathematician can do to help to, you know, in your general space, but you are also able to contribute some information to him about what you can do. And he didn't know that you could do that instantly, and hmm, that's quite interesting. He'll go away and do some research or look at another area. That networking is an important part of it, but it also means that I really shouldn't have had a hang-up about this. Because the thing that, that made me valuable was the thing that I essentially kept in the room. I kept being there. People wanted me to be there and I contributed when I was there. And I learned. I may have not done it consciously. I may have not done it as efficiently as I could have done. But I did learn. And after a few years, still being in the room is what matters. Not how you first got there. Now clearly, if you don't have the generic background training... You go into that room, you haven't got a clue what people are talking about, you can't contribute, your knowledge base goes down. You don't come out knowing more, you end up being a little bit more confused. You're never going to be able to improve your status in that room, you're never going to be able to contribute. The basic education is fundamentally important, it effectively teaches you the language and the grammar and the syntax. But then, you've then got to look, use that as the basis of going forward. A new student can come into that room and bring some new stuff which that room otherwise didn't have knowledge about. This can be the sort of thing which industry is researching in, the areas that they're working on, the techniques that they're, that they're using. Not to be an expert at it, but even to just flag up. There are other ways of doing this, and you know that, group, that room may not know that. It, re it recalibrated what being a design engineer is about too. Because I, I have been a chip designer, I have been a component designer, I have, I've looked at various little pieces as being a measure of my success. I'll do that, I completed my role, it didn't work, well it wasn't my fault. 
you know, I've, I've done that. And yet, it's become apparent to me, I can't do that. It's not good enough for my part to work. It has to work in the system. I have to know then about the things that are around what I'm going to design because that thing is going to be used in that environment. It's got to work in that environment. Um, yeah, any product, anything that I design, any part of work that I'm going to do is never going to be an end product in its own right. It's going to be a component or a subsystem of it or even something smaller than that. Um, it only works when they all work together. So continuous change, continuous challenge, continuous learning throughout 52 years of my working life. It sounds like a bit of a life sentence, doesn't it? But it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to spend your time doing. So much so that I don't want to retire. I don't want to. I don't want to do this. It's a scary world out there. I mean, this world, this change, this pace, which I've got used to, should be really scary, but it's not as scary as retiring. Okay, that's scary. But there is no wonder that I always felt that my knowledge was lacking. It's just the way of the world. So that's a, a side um, slide. I'm not going to read it now. But it's just the, uh, the, the, some of my thinking, and some people have, had, had requested this slide, so I'll leave it here. But it's really just the four stages of learning, which are essentially formal to that point and informal afterwards. But uh, it's interesting to look at. So being a design engineer today, do I think that it's slowed down? Do I think the next 50 years is going to be, you know, just deploy what we know? Bah. In the same way as I deployed what I knew when I came out of college, it's going to be the same. The reality is the pace of change is going to be just as severe in the next 50 years as it's been in the last. Uh, and you, of course, as experts... You may not like the title because it implies knowledge, whereas uncertainty is likely to be the truth. Um, you will always be the ones who know more, more about it. You will always be the leaders. That's your role. So don't be afraid to admit when you don't know. Obviously, admitting what you don't know to politicians is a difficult thing, but admitting them to your peers is a good thing. Uh, you'll always, in reality, be part of a team um, trying to make order out of chaos. The design process is a chaotic process. It would be nice to be able to formalise it and make pert charts and live up to them and all the rest of it, but the reality is that only gives you a structure. The reality is it's a chaotic process every time. If it's easy, they don't employ engineers for it, they employ technicians for it. You know, engineers are there because you have that breadth of knowledge, that breadth of experience. You can bring lateralism together and you can work with others. That's what the engineer's role is. To contribute what you know to overcome the team's challenge, um, strive to acquire new knowledge for yourself at every meeting, get yourself invited to the next. Remember that the successful end product pays for everything in their life cycle. Nobody lives in a bubble. No matter how far down the academic life, uh, life cycle you are, if you're, in, you're doing research into something totally abstract, if you're in a bubble, you will sooner or later get cut off. If, if nobody understands where your, your role is in the life cycle of something which has got value, then sooner or later the, the budget for it will get cut off. So people can temporarily live in bubbles. They can't live there permanently. The other thing is for your own sanity, learn to appreciate what you have done. Look around you and see how much has changed in your lives. Because... It should have been easy for me to see the amount of change that was going on in my life. You can see how much change I've handled, and yet I didn't see it. I just came into work every day like you come into work every day. I just tackled the problems that were in front of me on that day. I tended not to look around, but look around. You feel a lot better when you do, because it helps you to understand where you are. Embrace the uncertainty, though. It is your job to deliver the extraordinary. Whatever it is you're doing, research or science or engineering, that's what you're going to be employed for. Not for doing the ordinary stuff. They get technicians for doing that. At that point, I have got to the end. This is now slide 31 of 23. <laughs> I will quite happily take any other questions that haven't arisen so far. We've gone fairly over time, but I think we've gone over time. Such a nice talking point.